evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the latest in the university's inaugural lecture series. Tonight we have Professor Fahad Mendes talking to us about natural language processing, a fulfilled promise. Well, I'd like to now introduce you to Professor Sunil Madeira from the University of Salford, who is a long-standing colleague of Farid's, and I will say no more. Thank you, uh, Chair of Professor Council, uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, friends and family. Uh, welcome to this inaugural session from uh, Professor Farid Mezian. Uh, uh, as the Chair of Professorate Council said, I've known uh, Farid for uh, over 30 years uh, and I've had the pleasure of witnessing many of his contributions to the field and to the development of others. Uh, in fact, uh, he was my first PhD student uh, over 30 years ago. Uh, you can see from my age that uh, I'm still young mainly because of Farid. <laughs> I first met Farid in 1988 when he wanted to pursue a PhD because he found the MSc very easy. And I suggested two ideas, one that involved refinement of a machine learning algorithm and a second which I thought was near impossible, which, which aimed to produce formal specifications from English language, English language with all its ambiguities and the challenges it has. So that still remains a challenge and you can guess that Farid chose the more difficult option, despite my efforts to convince him otherwise. This typifies Farid's career. He's, he's one that takes on challenges. He then uh, succeeds in those challenges. In the case of for, uh, producing uh, formal specifications from natural language, he was able to develop the principled way of doing uh, that translation. Uh, translating natural language is, is, is quite a task even today, quite a challenge today. Not only was he able to do that, uh, people would argue that it, it's just theoretical work, but in Farid's case, he took it further. He applied it to a real case study and was able to get results from a real case study. This still remains a challenge of showing the, the kind of uh, quality of work that Farid produces, uh, not only then, but throughout his career. In fact, uh, the examiners were so impressed, they insisted on zero corrections to his thesis. He's still one of the few PhDs that I've supervised that have got zero corrections in the thesis. This uh, also kind of highlights his ability to supervise others because his own standards are so high. He can he'll always use his own experiences as, as, as a PhD student. Uh, in, in fact, he just reminded me that at the time I was supervising him, I was also doing a PhD and he was trying to race ahead of me. And, and try and get his PhD before his supervisor got his PhD. After his PhD, Farid was recruited by the University of Malaysia, Sarawak, as a lecturer in software engineering, where he established a new program in software engineering, encouraged research, and became the director of postgraduate studies. Farid returned to Salford in 1998, after much persuasion from me to apply for that role. Where his commitment to quality research and development of new programs, like an undergraduate master's program in software engineering, uh, led to growth in student numbers at Salford, increased collaborations, and he also increased our PhD student numbers and research grant income. He was promoted to a senior lectureship in 2004, a readership in 2007, and a chair in 2012. He served with distinction in many leadership roles, including as Associate Dean International, Head of the Data Mining and Patent Recognition Research Center, and was appointed the lead for the Salford REF submission. I understand the results have just come out, so we'll look at those and then get in contact with Farid to, to let him know how well he did. His move to the University of Derby opens a new opportunity, where I'm sure his ability to build teams and bring, uh, bring colleagues together will lead to great things for you. Internationally, Farid is best known for transforming the natural language and databases series of conferences. That this series, I recall, was struggling uh, in 2004. It, it hardly had any uh, papers uh, prior to 2004, and it was close to uh, shutting down. Until, of course, Farid came on the scene. 
he brought it to Salford, established an active programme committee and used his international network of contacts to dramatically increase the student numbers, uh, increase the paper numbers, uh, uh, increase the quality of the conference. Of course, he brought it to Salford. Uh, I'm not suggesting it was the Salford that gave, him, gave it the extra uh, papers. It was very much parried. Uh, the, the programme committee was so impressed with what, what he'd achieved uh, they constantly invited him to organize further conferences, and he organized the further three conferences at Salford. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure there will be a conference at Derby that will follow as a result of Farid uh, being the, one of the lead, leads in this conference. There's only one thing that Farid is more committed to than, than, his, than his work and his professional work. It's his family. And I'm pleased to see that Nasiba and the rest of the family here, here Nasiba, Yasin, Amir and Adam are his first love and, and he's always infusing about them, about the work they do, so I'm really, uh, it's really great that they're here today. I know that like, like me you're looking forward to his presentation, so without further delay uh, please welcome Farid to present his inaugural seminar. Thank you, Sunil, for this presentation. And uh, ladies, colleagues, friends, and family, thank you very much for joining me tonight for my inaugural lecture at the University of Derby. The, I've done quite a few topics of research, but I thought that the one topic that I have done since my early days in research was that of natural language. And therefore, I'm going to talk about this. Computers are some amazing machines, as we all know, and we use them today. However, they have not been always friendly in the early years, and surely you cannot take them home to finish your work or do your assignments. So this is how they look like in those days. Communicating with computers in those years were also, or was also a challenge. If you want to give them a simple instruction, such as z equal x plus y, then this is what you need to write, those successions of ones and zero. This is the only language that computers can understand in those days, and this is known as the machine language. Some improvements were made over the years, and then we managed to develop another set of languages called assembly languages. So the program is only what you see here. The rest is just a description of what that program is doing. This is far from our language, but at least there are some terms there that we can understand. We've got PROC, that stands for procedure. We have uh, CMP, that stands for comparison. And towards the end of the program, we have a return and, and program. However, a few years later, we managed to develop a different set of languages. And these are known as high-level languages. Finally, we can define variables the way we want, and programs in those languages looked more like English. So something that we are more comfortable with, that we can understand, and it helped software engineers a lot in maintaining the software because they can understand what previous programmers have done. Of course, this is not natural language processing, but this is just giving you an idea about the challenges that computer scientists have faced from the beginning and where they tried to uh, communicate with computers in a language that they are more comfortable with, that they are more familiar with. Before giving a brief history of natural language processing, it's worth mentioning what is known these days as the Alan Turing test or the imitation game. So Alan Turing, probably one of the brightest minds that this country has produced, stated in 1950 that a human being is going to evaluate a conversation in natural language. And then, basically, you are going to evaluate two. One is going to be produced by a machine. The other one is going to be produced by a computer. And if you cannot distinguish between the two, then you can say that your application, your software, or your system has passed the Alan Turing test. 
there was quite some work that was done, I think prior to 1950 during the war, but they were only ideas. And there was no documented research in terms of NLP in those days. And the first phase of NLP was between the late 40s and also the late 60s. So they continued on the idea of using computers for translating from one language to another. So this is known as machine translation. It was very basic. So basically what they used to do is have two different dictionaries and then the translation was word for word. So everything was based on words and was based on syntax. We need to understand also the environment in which those systems were developed. So there was, it is the first time that computers, or we tried, computers have tried to process data that was not numeric, so it was text, and it was a challenge for computers. And then we don't have any computing powers in those days. Any mobile phone that you've got in your pocket today is probably 10 times or more powerful than the best computers in that period. Um, we don't have storage like what we have got today. And when you are dealing with languages, you need large storage for we know vocabulary, grammars, and so on. And the most challenging one is, is that programming in those days was done in the assembly language. So it's another difficulty. So there was about 20 years of research. And then suddenly, around uh, 1966, the ALPAC report came out. So this is the Automatic Language Processing Advisory Committee, and this is the body that sponsored research in machine translations in the States. So they were providing a lot of money. So by 1966, they have taken the decision that computers cannot translate from one language to another, and therefore they have stopped all funding. Thanks God, there was a little bit of funding that was left. It was for computational linguistics. <clears throat> and then came phase two, and this is also a period, so this is from late 60s to the late 70s. This is also a period where artificial intelligence has started developing as a subfield of computer science. So it's no surprise that most of the works that were done at the time were based on IA techniques that were available in those days. So most works were about developing question answering systems. Uh, for those who are in the field, so you probably know that ELISA was the first system to be developed, but there were also other systems such as baseball and lunar. Uh, baseball was trying to answer questions about all events related to uh, baseball season within the United States, and uh, lunar was trying to answer questions about the geological properties of the rocks that were brought back from the moon uh, through different Apollo missions. Uh, so. It's basic, if we look at them today, they use what we call pattern recognition. So they're looking at structures within the questions and try to find if there is a similar structure within the answers. So facts were taken from experts and put in databases. And then if there is a match, then you provide an answer. In 71, at a conference, Lunar has managed to answer 90% of the questions from an audience that we are not aware of the work or how the internals of the lunar system works. For the first time, we have also started talking about what is known in those days as the world knowledge. So this is the context in which those systems were operating. So today, we talk about semantics. So this is how it all started. And then we have on the other side, we have linguists that started developing a different type of grammars. These are known as transformational grammars or transformational generative grammar. So there are grammars where you can say that the sentence is composed of two parts, for example, a noun phrase and a verb phrase. A verb phrase is composed of a verb and a noun phrase, etc. And Chomsky was very known for this, and he published his first book in 1965. And then we have the semantic frames. So for the first time, we're trying to give or create some kind of structures uh, with some kind of cohesion of some concepts within a particular field. And then we went to the late 70s and late 80s. This period is known as the grammatical lexical phase. So for the first time, people have started using logic to represent knowledge inside those databases. And therefore, we were able to have some inferences and provide more if you want to precise uh, answers to the questions that were asked in those days. 
And they emphasized during that period, and it was what we were doing at that time, was on declarative and unification as the fundamental processes in those days. And then the, we had also, around that time, the first idea of exploring more applications for natural language processing, and in my particular case, it was about conceptual modeling. So I'm not that old, so I only been introduced to natural language processing towards the end of 1980s, so it was precisely 1989, like Sunil has just uh, mentioned, and he also mentioned the kind of work that I have under undertaken with him. The only problem at the time was to try to explain to colleagues, computer scientists, what I'm trying to do, but more difficult was to explain this to friends and colleagues that were doing engineering on the first floor of the Newton building, where most of their work was computational fluid dynamics, and it was basically just taking equations, put them into forefront, run, have some data, have some graphs, and that's the end of it. Try to tell them that software is more than this. So the expectations were very high, what a computer science PhD students can do. So I couldn't explain to them straight away, so I told them, I'm learning. I don't know about formal methods, I didn't know about uh, natural language processing, and they have never programmed in Prolog. And then one morning, tada, miracle happened, run my program, something happened. So we called those friends and told them, look, there is something that I want to show you today. So set on F34, and then called the Prolog interpreter, this is what you get in those days, and then you've got that question mark, meaning that give us a query, what do you want? And then this is what I provided, a sentence. That sentence was used a lot in those days to explain how logical form language works. So a man loves a woman. And then he said, okay. And then he pressed enter. And this is what you get. And then he looked at me and said, that's it? He said, yeah, that's it. He looked at me and said, is this Five, uh, five months of work, I said, yes, this is what it is. And more things are going to happen, but for the time being, this is all what I'm getting. So the joke for the next five months or six months was whether the man was still loving that woman or not. So you get on with that, and then I tried to explain things to them, but it was too late. So just going quickly, so this is what happens really inside. So you have a sentence, so that's part of a case study about a stock management system. Then the sentence is, or we use a grammar to create a syntax tree for that sentence. And then from there, of course, we produce logical form language, which is that. And then from that logical form language, it was easy to move to predicate logic, which looks more mathematical than the logical form language. And then from there, we were able to produce some specifications for operations. Some of them were very simple, such as just adding an item into the stock but some were more complex, such as reordering items from the stock. So you need to understand the relationship between the attributes of those, uh, the attributes of that data type, and then decide that when you want to reorder, this means that the quantity in stock is less or equal than the minimum reorder level. So there was a lot of processes that had taken place there. Uh, Sunil has mentioned that case study, so we wanted something real, something that was developed independently from us, and we got a case study from the British Aerospace about a real problem, planning a flight route from point A to point B, and the route is planned as a set, or more precisely, as a sequence of Y points, and Y point is identified by an identifier, which is a number and a grid reference. Again, after a few months of work, we did manage to produce some very good specifications for most of the operations that were needed. That was my first paper that was published. I don't remember having any issues in getting it published. Uh, what you can remember or can see is in those days, we don't have emails, so it's only names and the department address that we've got on our papers. And then got my PhD, moved to University of Sarawak. Um, it was a very good experience for us particularly as a family. And my second son, Yassin here, was born there. Uh, we learned a lot of things. 
uh, as, as a family, for example, never tried to have your breakfast outside. You have always unwanted visitors. And that particular morning, we had all our cereals taken away, and the milk was also taken away. We have also learned that you should never swim with jellyfish, and it's quite dangerous. Anyway, I continued to work with Sunil, or collaborating with Sunil, and then we came out with this second paper, which was published in the Annals of Software Engineering. And it was quite a strong paper. We reviewed all the systems that tried to produce formal specifications in those days, and we have suggested a new architecture for those systems, and we have also proposed some directions for future research. The most important aspect here that is new is this concept of internal representations that you've got here and viewing modes. So we want to have different modes uh, when we develop software. We know that it can be natural language, it can be formal specifications, or other models such as object models. So moved back to Salford in 1998. Um, there are some dates there that are quite very important for, for me. So in 1995, there was this first NLDB conference that Sunil has mentioned. So it was a group of researchers from Versailles in France and also uh, another group from Amsterdam in Holland. They have started to see whether it was possible to query databases using a natural language. They came together, they created the first workshop in 1995, and in, in 2001, I managed to get to the conference and I attended the first NLDB. So I felt really at home. It was just everything that those speakers were talking about is something that either we did or we tried to do. And then after the first break, the two co-chairs of the conference came to me and said, well, you seem to know a lot of things about what we are doing and when are you going to present your paper and what are you going to talk about? I said, no, I'm not going to present a paper, actually. I find out about the conference late, and I'm just attending. Oh, I said, and what research were you doing? I said, well, trying to produce formal specifications from VDM, and then said, oh, are you the VDM person? I said, yes, I am. I said, oh, for many years we were writing to you at your address at Salford, trying to get you to the conference and inviting you, but you never replied. Say, so, yeah, I did not reply because I was away and I was in Malaysia. And then Sunil has mentioned that three years later, I organized the conference in Salford, and if everything goes to plan next year, we are going to organize it here at Derby. Uh, there was quite a lot of interest from many of the researchers in automated software engineering, or using it natural language for uh, uh, system modeling. And then going back to that vision that we had, I tried to implement it as my first research task really at Salford. So we had three PhD students working on that, or two PhD and one in field. Um, the two PhD students did not do a good job. So the one that trying to work from, so trying to get them to work on that internal representation, which in those days was XML. So we wanted to implement it. So the first PhD students, the one who tried to move from natural language to object models through the internal representation, left after a year and a half for uh, some kind of uh, financial issues, and then the other one was working on object models into the formal specifications, again, through the entire representations. Um, then we had an, an issue, a private company, IFAD, in Denmark, has taken the problem, solved it, produced a book, produced software, and so on. So we struggled to get some kind of novelty in that work and get the PhD students to graduate. The best work was produced by an Enfield student. So it was generating natural language specifications from UML class diagrams. And it is up to now the most cited of my papers. The, this is the architectures that we have proposed for that system. There is nothing, I would say, uh, new in, in the mid layer here. This is how uh, systems that generate natural language were designed in those days. But the most important were this databases that we've got here, WordNet. So this then was the transition between what I would call my first research and also moving to the next phase, which in this case was the beginning of phase four, so late 80s and 2000s. So this is the era of large lexicons. We start producing very large vocabularies, and it was the web, it was availability of large quantities of machine readable texts or data in general, but mainly text. And then we have more power 
in hardware and the machines, and then some other disciplines emerged and developed such as knowledge engineering, information extraction, and information retrieval. So they were probably given the tools to expand and to become better. And then we have the ontologies, of course. At the same time, we have the advent of statistical natural language processing, use of statistics for natural language processing. Ontologies, you're just putting some kind of vocabularies together, you create relationships between them, and then you have a model of data for a particular field, medicine, for example, or conceptual modeling, or you can do it for a full language. And this is what WordNet has tried to do. And when you have ontologies, you allow knowledge sharing between scientists. You encourage knowledge reuse between different systems and different components. You can communicate in a clear way between systems and users. And it was supported by uh, some languages, such as the web uh, ontology language, or OWL, and also some tools, such as Protege. So what we've got here, really, is just a part of a medical ontology where you have concepts and then how they are related. Um, here, you've got part of WordNet. So this is only for the verb make, uh, con, and also, uh, I don't can remember, read that one, okay. Okay, yeah, so it shows all the relationships between those verbs, those words, and so on, and how they are linked together. So that was the transition from what I used to do and the new era. And then I was quite lucky that you have moved quickly into this area because it was also a period where with colleagues from the Department of the Built Environment, we have managed to secure about three EU-funded projects. And those projects, we were mainly working on documents that are generated or that were generated in the construction domain. So they're quite complex. There is quite, they're quite messy. Different terminologies were used and users were not able to extract the right documents to manage the different versions of the documents and so on. So we came with the idea of producing some kind of new methods that are going to use the available technologies in those days. And this is what we have produced. So the system really was based on some solid theoretical foundations, but it was also deployed in a real, uh, I would say, kind of business model setting, meaning that companies have used it. So what we did there was mainly have these ontologies or create an ontology for the construction domain, having some concepts that are defined there that are used and then have some kind of automated indexing of those documents, meaning that you are going to have across all different users the same words for indexing those documents. This will make not only searching and categorizing those documents more efficient, it also allows to follow any uh, kind of updates on those documents and re-index them if needed. So the work was quite interesting. It was published in the Information Sciences Journal. And then we moved into another application. Uh, I think for those from the Computer Science Department, you probably have heard about this uh, last year. So I presented the work in the Data Science Research Center seminars. So radiologists have a big issue when it comes to reporting the output of an examination, and it's written in natural language, and language that is incomplete. Sometimes they are using abbreviations that no one can understand, and we're trying to des de design something that will be standard. And the aim is that if we've got something that is standard, we can then use machine learning techniques or natural language techniques to analyze the data and use some kind of artificial intelligence in those reports. So we have used in that work one of the strongest uh, linguistic theories that existed in discourse analysis, which is the rhetorical structure theory, together with the ontologies. And we have produced a system that did work very well. And then the system not only allows the use of the standard document that we have produced with all the data laid out the way we want it for further analysis. But we have also a system that allowed to transform reports that are written in natural language, so new ones and old ones, into the standard form. 
we realize that some radiologists, they don't want to use the new one. They want to keep writing in free text. We allowed them to do so, but our program was transforming that into uh, the standard form. Right, so for me, it's more like the end of an era. So here, I do remember my kids coming one day and saying, well, this is what happens in chemistry. We, we were told some kind of chemistry one year, and the second year you go there and say, forget about what you have learned. That was fake chemistry. Now we are going to start learning about real chemistry. So what happens in the last few years, exactly similar to that, it's as someone is telling you, forget everything that you have learned. This is not how we do th things. Things are going to be different. So remember that back in 1999, we had the start with the beginning of statistical NLP. And then there was usage of machine learning in many other fields and with success. And then we had also deep learning. Have more data available and we have more computing powers. So it was the era where deep learning and machine learning came in. Now I'm going to go quickly and try to explain some of the blocks that are needed for this new era of NLP processing. First of all, you need a language model. So a language model is just a probabilistic model. In its simplest form, you have a word or two or three words that you have already encountered or read, and then you try to predict what is the next word. So this is what you do if you write an email or text sometimes. You see something that is coming up, and if you want to accept that, accept it, just press enter and you get it. So if we assume that our corpus is only these five sentences that you've got here, then what we've got is what is the probability of having you knowing that you have just encountered the word think. So based on this corpus that you've got here, there is only one sentence that has that, and it's the first one. We have think and then followed by you. So the probability is going to be the number of times that thank you occurs divided by the number of times that th uh, thank occurred. And therefore, in this particular context, within this corpus, the probability is one. And therefore, we can guarantee that whenever you have thank, this is going to be followed by you. Of course, we have more complex representations. You can consider two words, three words, or four words at a time. And then for Diego and San, so here we've got three inst two instances where San Diego uh, was mentioned, so the third one and the fourth one, but we have three sentences where uh, San is, uh, is also used. This is the fifth one with San Francisco. So the probability of having Diego after the Sun is going to be uh, two thirds or 0 0.67. Okay, and then we have neural networks. So I'm not going to give you a lecture on neural networks, but neural networks are some very powerful models. So they're trying to mimic the way our brain works. So we have inputs, as part of that input layer, and we have so many layers inside that we call usually hidden layers. They do a lot of processing, a lot of calculations, and then they produce some results. So the way they work is they go forward, they have some kind of weights, and then they get the outputs. If the outputs are not good, they go backwards and update all those weights until they get an output that is acceptable, good, or precise. And then we also need a language representation. So just like we humans uh, need a proper representation for a language, uh, machines also need a language representation. So we need an alphabet, we need to understand the way words are formed, the grammars, and so on. And this is what machines also need. So we need to provide some kind of efficient uh, language model. For many years, we've been using vectors to represent words or documents. So when you have a document and you want to index your document, you are selecting a set of keywords. And those keywords really are put as a vector. And then when you compare two documents, for example, you try to find out the similarity between the words that are in those two vectors and say whether the two documents are similar or not. So the easiest way to do that in the old days was to use what we call the cosine similarity measure. So when you plot those vectors representing item one and item two, they're going to have an angle in between. And then that angle is called theta, and the smallest theta is 
the closest in meaning the two concepts are. And then the cosine is uh, larger for small angles and smaller for, sm uh, for la la larger ones. So if you have, let's say, many words, you are going to compare each pair of words to find out which document is more likely to be similar to the one that you have seen. Or if you are working at the word level, finding the meaning of the two words that are close in meanings. There is one other representation, and this is known as the one hot representation. So this is very simple. So what you do here is if we have a sentence, welcome to my inaugural lecture. So welcome is going to be the first word, and therefore we are going to put one in the first position and followed by zeros. Two is the second word, so you're going to have one in the second position, and you go all the way until you get the last word lecture here, and you put one at the end. So what you've got here is just a very simple representation. So if you've got, let's say, 1,000 words, so your vectors are going to be of size 1,000. In the early days, this was not really very popular. You, we all know when you work with matrices that if you've got plenty of zeros and only few ones, that it's not an efficient way to store data, and particularly trying to work with matrices when it comes to processing them. And then we had really what was the game changer in the field. This is the introduction of what is known as word embeddings. So basically, someone came and said, what if we are not going to do all those relationships. We are not going to do the cause similarities. Or we are not going to find when two words are similar in meanings. What if we just throw a large vocabulary to a learning network or a deep learning model and let it work and find out the similarities itself? So that was really a big changer. So they, this is really a class of techniques rather than one, one individual technique. And the most popular one and probably strongest one is word to vec And it was designed and patented by Google, and it was trained on over three million words and has got 300 dimensions, meaning that 300 uh, embeddings. And this is how it works. So you throw three million words to another network, and remember that another network is going to look at all the documents that are available to it. So every basically piece of news that Google had was looked at. So it's like you or a person reading thousands and thousands of books, thousands and thousands of pieces of news, and then you remember everything saying that every time this word is mentioned, somehow, somewhere, the other word is mentioned. This means that there must be some kind of relationship between them. Uh, so if you Imagine the amount of data that we have available these days and the kind of training that has taken place. Then we have managed to get into this stage. So if we have, let's say, uh, four words there and four words here, this vector is telling us, for example, that a cat is 0 0.6, similar to something that we can identify as a living being. It's got 0 0.9 as being feline, 0 0.1 being a human, and so on. We did the same thing with kitten, dog, and houses. So this model then is produced, and it's fixed. We can use it. So suddenly, we have millions of words. Not only we know what those words are, but we also know how they are related to the rest of the embeddings, to the words of the categories that we have defined. We cannot plot this on 7D dimension that we've got here. So if you reduce them to 2D, then this is what you're going to get. You notice that cats and kittens are very close here, house is out there, and dog is here. You can do and draw your vectors here and look at theta, but who cares about theta anymore these days? You've got there 7D, and we have that information. If you are looking for relationships between concepts, then this is what you are going to get. You are going to find out that a man and a woman, somehow they are related. And then a king and a queen, they are also related. But remember, these are vectors. If you have vectors, you can define operations on the vectors. And if you can define operators, then you can end up with things like this. 
you can say that king minus man plus woman equal queen. So, of course, what we've got there between brackets is a vector representing that word. So, it may not make sense the first time you read this, but what it says basically is if you have a king and you take the man out of the king and you replace it with a woman, you are going to get a queen. Same thing, if you take away France from Paris and you replace it with Germany, then you're going to have the capital of Germany instead of the capital of France. So it's doing some weird things. If you think this is weird, then it is probably, but look at our brains as well, how they operate. I'm sure that many of you must have received something like this, a message that is written through combination of letters and numbers, special characters and so on. You might struggle to read the first line, but once you do the first line, you can read everything. Those messages will tell you probably that you are among the 10 most clever people in the world or so on, and it's not. Anyone can read this. So basically our brains, you don't need to have the full picture to understand a text. You probably just need to look at this. We've got only an M, but we can guess that it means message. And that if you go down there, amazing things, impressive things. So we can read this and our brain can take fractions of some information and make sense of this text. It's because we've been reading for years. We've been looking or listening to news for years. And we have built some kind of pictures in some inside our minds that allowed us to have this kind of understanding. Right, so on the surface, really, that's very easy to understand or at least to comprehend. These are the first layers of your uh, deep learning models. So you can have different or many layers there. So this is how it works. If you have one vector, like here, it represents a particular word. And the, what you've got here is the embedding weight matrix. So this is normally the layer that will come straight away after the input layer. And if you put all those vectors together, you are going to have a matrix. And then if you perform a multiplication between these two, you are going to end up having this. And this is only the third line that you've got here. So the, all the others are going to be zeros because of the zeros that you've got here. So suddenly, within the first two layers that you've got, you are going to have an output that is a vector with relationships with other words and meanings. So you are concentrating on the word that you want to process. And at the same time, you have all its relationships and characteristics within that particular domain. So that's really something important when it comes to understanding the meaning of words and therefore understanding texts. However, that's not as simple as it looks like. So we have more complex things inside. Once you move away from this first layer, this is what you get. So if we take an example where recurrent neural networks are used, so this is a special type of neural networks, then this is what you get in the first instance. Every word is going to have a cell in your recurrent neural network. And one of the inputs to your recurrent network is going to be the embedding vector of the word, meaning the word and its relationship with all the others. Not only this, but you are going to, or those cells are going to communicate between them. So every time that you have some kind of understanding, you provide it as an input to the next cell, and therefore you add more things. So this is what I have learned, and this is the new word. So I'm going to move to the next step, which is either generating the text, answering the questions, or anything. But we are collecting all the knowledge that we had. And then, of course, we have this special function, in this particular case, the tanh function that controls everything, make sure that all the values that we've got will remain between minus one and one, making sure that learning is taking place in an efficient way, and we're not getting some extraordinary large numbers. So it works and produced some good results. However, there are some issues. Because it's a very long kind of sequence of words, so you may end up having thousands of those cells. And there are two problems there. One of the problems is trying to remember everything. So those systems are known to remember what is just being processed. So the cells that are just next to the one that you are processing, 
But if you have a cell that is 300, 400 words before, then that kind of knowledge, that kind of information that we have, we tend to forget it, or at least the system tends to forget it. There is also another theoretical problem that is related to this, is that of the vanishing gradient problem. So I'm not going to mention this. So these are the mathematics behind the uh, um, basically neural networks and also the uh, deep learning models. So what you've got then is the cells of those recurrent neural networks became very complex. So each one of them is a deep learning model itself. So you are going to have many functions there is going to be an input gate, so we start talking about gates inside those cells. And then once you've got this information that came in, then you have a special gate that we call forget gate. So it is this one that you've got here. So you've got an input that is based on what you have learned previously, and you decide on what you want to remember and what you want to forget. By doing this, we are making sure that all the information that we want to remember is passed to the next uh, cell. But things that we are not interested in, we just tend to forget them. It is a basic operation. It is a sigmoid function that you've got there. If you multiply it by zero, you ignore it, it's gone. If you multiply it by one, it's there, or something in between. You want to keep that information and you pass it to the next stage. The Again, improvements have taken place a lot, and then we moved into sequence-to-sequence -sequence processing. So this is another model of deep learning. And again, they can be used for different applications. The first one, what we've got, is a system that translates from English to French. So what we've got here, really, is the system will start with the beginning of the English sentence. They are watching. It's going to do all the things that we have just mentioned. So it's going to look at the word uh, they, the looking later on to uh, are, going to use the information that they have learned before this. They pass this information to the next cell. They read watch it, uh, the next word, which is watching here, and so on. And then by the time they get to the end sentence cell that we've got here, it passes it to another recurrent neural network. So we have two types of recurrent neural networks here. One is called the encoder, and the other one is called the decoder. So as soon as all this information is known and passed to the beginning of sentence cell, the system would have, in theory, enough information to generate the first word of the French translation. And then once we have the first word, so this is passed again to the, to the next cell, and this is, this is knowledge that we have learned so far, but plus the word that we have just generated here will be another input. And with these two, we are going to generate the third wo word and so on until we reach the end of the sentence. So this is how they work. We can also use it for um, question answering systems. So we do the same process. We read the question here, how are you? And we do the same thing by the end of or when you encounter here the question mark, which is the end of the sentence, we have enough information for our question answering system to start answering and saying, for example, here, I am fine. Then we managed to solve this problem. Came another problem, particularly when it comes to translation. Um, it's not a linear process. So, for example, if you take French and English in this case, when you talk about adjectives in French, you say, La Maison Blanche, for example, the White House. But you start with la maison, you start with the noun and then the adjective. But when you do it in English, you start with the adjective and then the noun will come. So when you are processing a sentence like this, what you do is you reach a case like this and then you suspend your processing and you put a lot of attention on another part of the sentence or the text. You process it and then you come back to the rest of it. So we talk here about sequence to sequence attention. So we pay more attention to some parts of the sentence. Uh, so you cannot just sit and admire what all those researchers have done and the contribution that they have made to the field. I think I've also worked in this and have made some contribution. So I'm working with some colleagues in trying to translate Arabic to English and then English to Arabic. 
when you have a language like Arabic, you don't have rich resources like what you would have for French and English. So we have seen perfect answers for both systems, the one that translates and also the one that answers questions. But the reality is slightly different. So it is probabilities you are good to have different answers or possible answers. And then if you work towards the end of the decoder phase, and if you produce some sentences, then we have proposed here a method that is using other features to select, first of all, the n best solutions for the translation. And then once we have those 10 best, we're going to, again, go and get for the maximum. So the work was quite excellent and was published in machine translation. This is, I would not say the top, but this is the journal for machine translation. This is where most research on machine translation is published. Right, so this is probably my, the last contribution that I'm going to make. I was going to make a couple of demonstrations here, but I think you've got the links there, and I'm just going to mention without disconnecting and then going to Google and then try something that may not work. I'm not going to talk about Siri and Alexa. I'm sure you all know about these two. I'm sure you have all used them. But the most important is I don't know how many of you are using Google Translate. A person like me, I write reports in different languages, and sometimes I have to translate from language to another. I used to spend a lot of time doing this, but these days you copy, you paste into Google, you choose your language, and you've got your translation. So I tried a piece of BBC News in uh, just a couple of days ago. The translation from English to French was perfect. I'm not a French native speaker, but I understand the language very well, and I have worked with it many times. I cannot do better than that. Tried Arabic, it was nearly perfect. I was hoping that I would do the demonstration and probably check with some Chinese colleagues to see whether the Chinese <laughs> translation was good or not. But everybody is saying that what Google is producing these days is near perfection. The other one is that link. If you follow it, you're going to find out a text that when you read it, you thought it was written by a human being, but it is, was not. It was generated by a computer, a full story, everything that you would expect for, from a good writing. So this is where we are at the moment in terms of uh, research. So I'm going to summarize by asking a few questions. So go back to Alan Turing in 1950 and see whether the current systems really have passed the Turing test. The answer is certainly yes. So look at the translations, look at the questioning systems that we've got these days, look at the text that is generated. You will not really notice a difference between what was produced by an expert or a human being and what is produced by, um, by a computer system. Second question was, remember in 1966, that report said that machines cannot translate from language to another. They are. So 50 years later, machines can do better than humans. Maybe not in, when it comes to two languages, but that system can translate from any language to any language. And humans cannot do that. And then the questions that probably I have asked at the beginning, whether NLP has fulfilled its promises. I think it did. I think what we have seen, or what we have seen over the last few years, is amazing in the way language engineering has progressed and what we have as results. And then, maybe the last question, is it the end? No, it is not. We see more and more algorithms coming every six or seven months. Google has dominant share in, on this, put a lot of resources on this, but watch the space. We're going to have more and more surprises when it comes to natural language. So technically, that is the end of my talk. I would not have achieved this or what I have achieved in my career without the support of many people. I'm going to start with my family and my wife that is here today. I got her support from my last couple of years from my PhD all the way until today, I would say. <laughs> and um, 
she followed me all the way to the jungle of Borneo, so I cannot ask for more. <laughs> so thank you very much for all those years and for all your support. Uh, got three boys that were always very competitive, very challenging, so competition was very, I would say, in, in, at home. It's always there to correct you if you pronounce the word incorrectly. So I try to tell them that, look, English is my fourth language, you know. I have learned three different languages before I got to English. And therefore, there are few things that you cannot get rid of. There are some accents that they will keep with me for the whole of my career. So, but they were there always. Oh, this is how you do things. This is how you pronounce things and so on. And then over the last few years, there was some adding to the family. And well, these addings have brought some kind of femininity into the family, which was otherwise a male-dominated one. So all your contributions and your help are welcome. And of course, I will never uh, thank enough Sunil for all those years. So I was really very lucky to have him as a supervisor in the first instance. As he has mentioned, we were working together. The relationship has always been two researchers working together. And it was a race on who is going to finish first. From teacher to PhD supervisor to a colleague, of course, we have developed friendship along those years, and then through having him as a boss. So he was a dean, I was the associate dean. So we worked really well over all those years. And I have learned a lot, not only from the computer science point of view, but from the way he looks at things, from the way he manages a thing, things. He has always led by example. Thank you very much, Sunny. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Fahid. Absolutely fascinating. As a botanist, this is just so far outside my comfort zone, but really learned a lot tonight. Anybody got any questions for Fahid? I think there is the cultural aspect. So I remember when I was in Malaysia, somebody told me about this. I started learning the Malay language. It was a very simple language, by the way. You can learn it in probably a few months. And then he told me that well, there is the culture that is different. So you sometimes say proverbs in one language. It's very hard to translate them into another one. So you have to find the equivalent. So Bringing the cultural level or the cultural aspect into a language will be, in my view, the next challenge in natural language processing. It's very easy to translate a book. It's very easy to translate or subtitle a movie. But if you have to go and live in a particular country where you haven't lived before, even if you speak the language, you are going to struggle to understand particularly some jokes. <laughs> I'm slightly amazed by somebody who thinks they can learn the Malaysian language in seven weeks. <laughs> I've worked out there. Yeah. Any other questions, colleagues? Louise. I think you're right. It's frightening for many research groups uh, when you have unlimited resources in terms of money and so on. Uh, it, it's very hard to challenge. And again, for colleagues here at the university, if we really want to do research in this area, then this is the kind of investment that we need to do, supercomputers, resources, storing them and accessing them. There is a lot of work that is done or is still be done in, on the theoretical side of, of the algorithms. Is it going to be easy? No. So the last bit of research that I have produced I was quite lucky that the person or the students had a very strong mathematical background and that for, managed to do the kind of research and contributed a bit towards the end of the spectrum. But if you work in that area, I agree with you that I will myself struggle to see what I'm going to do today, that I am confident that Google is not going to come up with something better tomorrow, publish it, and then I withdrew all my uh, work to, to basically 
uh, and it will become obsolete. So the, what we advise students to do is always the state of the arts is probably the most important. So you read something or you read the literature, and, uh, and which is very important. Try to find the gap in that research. I'm sure there are many gaps that are still available there. If you look at papers or conferences on deep learning, there are always papers that are coming up. But once you start working that, publish quickly, because things change rapidly in this field. And if you wait, when you have an idea, if you wait too long, someone else may publish this work. But if we want to tackle this area, then we need some resources in terms of computing powers, in terms of attracting the right PhD students with the right background. Yeah, I, I fully agree with you. So there are areas that are going to be very difficult to translate. I have mentioned jokes. I have also mentioned poetry is another field where I'm lucky enough to be able to read in four languages. So when you read a poem in one language, if you try to translate it, it just loses its meaning completely, particularly if there are elements of culture that are incorporated in, 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 in that particular poem or text, in fact. And Finding out where culture starts and where language, I mean, where language stops and culture starts is it, quite very difficult. And this is why it's, I thought this is where most of the work in the future. So if we want machines, it's like programming languages. We want the programming languages that can be used on different computers. If we have translation systems, particularly people looking at robots to be used. So if you take that robot, from one country to another, the robot has to adapt itself to the culture of that country. There are some words maybe that you cannot pronounce in other countries. There are some words in one language they mean one thing, in another they mean completely something different that you are not supposed to <laughs> mention at all or pronounce. So it's this kind of, the next level in my view, this is where things are going to happen. I feel sorry for colleagues that are going to teach humanities in the future. You are probably going to have programs that can generate essays by the students. And you are not going to find, <laughs> through uh, plagiarism software, anything that the student has presented or has written, because nobody has written it before, but it was not the work of the students. The computer program has generated it. So this is also something that you need to watch, particularly us as lecturers and university professors. So something is going to happen in the future where computers will be able to do assignments. Hoping that it's not going to be in computer science, but I'm sure it's going to be in other areas. Thank you for that concern. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, it's check. We have many, many systems that do this. So I think these were developed in the early age, in the early stages where we have what we call expert systems or knowledge based systems. So if you can capture what an expert knows and you put it into a computer program and the computer program can behave like an expert. If you are following the news, I think it was a couple of years ago, <coughs> Google has produced 
using deep learning, a model that was able to detect breast cancer better than the experts. You may wonder why. It's because an image is, when you look inside it, it's a set of numbers. So when we look at an image, we may not see a difference in colors between one region to another. But if you forget about what you see and you look as a machine to the numbers behind it, then you will probably notice that one is 59, the other one is 58. And this small difference will be detected and we probably ask or request the specialist to look at that particular point in the image. So we can have them to support specialists, support medicines, because, uh, or, or any other scientists, to be honest with you, because this can be applied for uh, pictures of rocks, of environments, and so on. So there's always something that computers can detect that human beings cannot, because we are limited on what we can see. And distinguish differences between areas of an image and areas of picture. Then, yeah, they're very well used in many other fields, these kind of models. Uh, and they have started producing results that are better than those produced by experts. Thank you. I think we'll leave the question to that point. Um, go on, you were very quick, Francis. Go on. Just <laughs> <laughs> under the wire there, sir. I'm sure there's going to be something in you. So as I have said, probably just three or four years ago, we thought that the basic uh, deep learning models will do it. Then we have different types of neural networks that have been produced to tackle different types of problems. They have been improved. And because what you do is you have a problem, you solve it with what you have. But if you don't have the right technology, then you try to find a new algorithm, a new model to solve it. And then the more you learn, the more problems you're going to find that your previous model cannot solve, and then you come out with a new model. So this is a process that has been going for the last probably 10 years in the field of natural language. So we don't see any reason why this is not going to be replicated in other fields where you are going to try to do something, but you find out that the technology available to you cannot do it, and you start thinking about new solutions and new models. In general, this is what happens in natural language. So from the 50s, people will try to do something that you don't have the tools and you don't have the power. Then it stays dormant for 10, 15 years. And then suddenly something will come out and then people will jump on it, apply those technologies and those theories, get to a particular point, And then we see another gap as well. And then, and so on and so forth until we get what we got today. So thank you very much indeed for coming. Our final, well done. Thank you.